Hi, I'm Jesse Alexander and welcome to Beyond the Great War, the monthly episode where we answer questions from our community and viewers just like you. Our first question comes from Ferusian Gambit in our YouTube comments. Are you going to cover the Bavarian Revolution? Arguably, it was a lot more consequential politically and in terms of its long-term effects than the Spartacus uprising in January 1919. Well, Mr. or Mrs. Gambit, we would love to. All right, so here we go. Now, in spring 1919, for a few weeks, there was actually a third Soviet territory in the world besides Russia and Hungary, the Bavarian Soviet Republic. So let's start with a little background here. Now, of course, since 1871, Bavaria had been a part of Germany and had its own local government and even had its own king. That all changed in November 1918 with the armistice and the revolution. The king was kicked out and an independent social democratic government under Kurt Eisner took power and declared the People's State of Bavaria, which remained within Germany. Now, in early 1919, things destabilized across the entire country. There was the Spartacus uprising in Berlin, which we covered in our first episode, there was a brief Soviet Republic in the city of Bremen, but things really heated up in March. A general strike in Berlin led to violence and another leftist uprising there, and the government cracked down extremely hard, with full-on battles with artillery, armored cars and fighter planes, which left more than 1,000 people dead. 75 of them were government troops. Now this all happened actually in the neighborhood around our studio, and this newspaper in front of me is filled with reports about the fighting around here. Now, on top of that, once the Hungarians declared themselves a Soviet Republic on March 21st, it seemed to would-be revolutionaries in Munich that the time was ripe. Revolutionary poet Erich Mühsam recalled, the news from Hungary hit Munich like a bomb. Now the Eisner government was in chaos since the independent Social Democrats had just lost the January election in Bavaria, and in February, Eisner himself had been assassinated on his way to resign his post by a nationalist aristocrat. On April 6th, the Soldiers and Workers Council of Munich declared Bavaria a Soviet Republic, and the elected government fled. Now, it seemed to many that the Bavarian Soviet Republic was indeed the final phase of a full German revolution. Author Thomas Mann, who lived in Munich at the time and did not support the Soviet, confided to his diary on April 7th, it may be assumed that the rest of Germany will follow. And the chairman of the Comintern and a leading Russian Bolshevik, Grigory Zinoviev, sent a supportive message to the revolutionaries. We are deeply convinced that the time is not far off when the whole of Germany will be a Soviet Republic. But all this was not to be. Bavaria was deeply conservative and rural, and most of the population had no interest in supporting a revolutionary government dominated by urban Jewish writers and poets like Erich Mühsam. Though, of course, there were German working class members as well, like former school teacher Ernst Nikisch. Now, the Soviets' policies of nationalizing banks and companies, abolishing capitalism, and letting universities be run by the students fell on deaf ears outside the coffee houses of Munich. On April 12th and 13th, troops loyal to the exiled Bavarian government, along with volunteer nationalists of the Tule Society, attempted a coup known as the Palm Sunday Putsch. Now, the coup attempt failed but both sides became radicalized as a result. The Soviet was taken over by Russian émigrés Max Levin and Eugen Levine, and more extreme policies were introduced, though internal violence was kept in check by the more moderate socialists and the relatively effective revolutionary courts. Government troops attacked again on April 18th, but were defeated at Dachau by the Bavarian Red Army. Now, this defeat prompted the exiled Bavarian Prime Minister Hoffmann to put out a call for volunteers. Bavarians, countrymen, in Munich rages a Russian terror unleashed by foreign elements. This insult to Bavaria must not be allowed to last another day, not even another hour. All Bavarians must immediately help, regardless of party affiliation. Munich calls for your aid. Come on, step forward. Now, the Munich disgrace must be wiped out. Now, thousands of Freikorpsmen, including future Nazi Ernst Röhm, answered the call and joined the government troops preparing to march on Munich. The offensive began soon after, and by April 27th, it became clear that the Soviet Republic was doomed, and the revolutionary government fell apart. Now, at this point, the violence began to spiral out of control. 
A group of Soviet radicals took nine aristocratic members of the right-wing nationalist Tula Society hostage in a school, plus a random art professor. And on April 29th, government troops massacred a group of 30 civilians as they advanced. And they also executed 53 Russian prisoners of war suspected of revolutionary sympathies. Now, further atrocities were enabled by Social Democratic Minister Gustav Noske's Schießbefehl, or shooting order, which was issued the next day. Whomsoever resists government troops by force of arms shall be shot forthwith. This gave government soldiers and Freikorpsmen license to execute suspected rebels on the spot and allowed the government to demonstrate its might, in spite of the relative weakness and isolation of the Soviet. Now, things got even worse on April 30th, when Red Army Guards executed the hostages at the school, including the lone female captive, who was a relative of a government commander. Now, the identities of the perpetrators are still unknown, and it's not clear if they considered it a reprisal for the government massacres of the previous day. Now, the hostage killings exploded in the press with rumors that Russians had been responsible. A local resident Josef Hofmiller wrote in his diary, They got the Russians drunk until they became complete animals and let them loose upon the unlucky hostages. Meanwhile, the fact that the Workers' and Soldiers' Council had condemned the murders was largely ignored. The city was now surrounded, and government artillery was brought up, and resistance was completely broken by May 1st. Now, the fighting and atrocities had cost the lives of between 600 and 1,000 people, 58 government troops, 135 rebels, some of whom had been executed after their capture, and hundreds of innocent bystanders. And much like the November armistice didn't stop the fighting in much of Europe, the killing didn't end with the stop of organized fighting. On May 6th, a group of Freikorpsmen acting on a false tip of Spartacus activity burst into a church meeting attended by 25 innocent Catholics. The soldiers tortured, bayoneted, and then shot them all, although four survived. Now, one of the few accused to admit his role in the affair, a soldier named Müller, testified at his trial. Today, I am sorry about it. I wanted to do good. I considered it my duty. It's possible that I struck with my bayonet, but I can't remember. The Bavarian Soviet Republic was gone, having lasted just three weeks. It would live on in German public memory as a murderous Russian abomination. But it was also another example, along with the Spartacist and March uprisings, of the Weimar government choosing to ally with the Freikorps and unleash uncontrollable violence on its own people, a fateful decision for the years to come. Now, if you're curious about the Bavarian Soviet Republic's perception in the countryside, as opposed to Munich, in this month's Great War Supporter podcast, we talked to German historian Frank Jakob, who just published his research on exactly this topic. Among other things, he explains why Bavarian skepticism and fear of Bolshevism didn't mean they weren't open to the idea of governance through councils. Now, the podcast is available to our YouTube members and Patreon supporters, and you can find more information about supporting the channel in the video description below. All right, so our second question is from Nick Bradbury. Nick asks, how did the Allies, but mainly the French and Belgians, recover the land and villages so quickly? Well, as early as 1915, French politicians began to evaluate the damage done to the country and to estimate what it might take to repair it. Now, by 1918, after three more years of shelling, neglect and occupation, large parts of northern and eastern France were completely devastated. And just to throw a few numbers at you, there were 2,500,000 hectares of farmland, 62,000 kilometers of roads, 2,000 kilometers of canals, 5,000 kilometers of railway, and hundreds of thousands of houses that were destroyed. Now, by early 1919, the last refugees forced out of their homes by the German offensives of 1914 and 1918 were returning home, if indeed they had a home to return to. However, for the first time in history, many of the warring states had promised their people to make good on the losses that they had to endure during the war. Modern war was total war, and the state had resorted to mobilizing every last citizen to do their part for victory. Now, once victory was achieved, the state was morally obliged to repair the damage and compensate its citizens for their sacrifices. In France, this was not just a promise made out of goodwill. The French state was actually bound by a law called the Charte des Sinistres, or Refugee Charter. Now, the French government instructed its own War Damage Commission under Minister of Finance Louis-Lucien Clotz to compensate every citizen affected by the war individually. But this, as you can imagine, was extremely expensive. 
Now in terms of the regions, the worst damage was done to the industrial areas of northern France, especially the coal mines, which were either damaged or used by the Germans during the war. Reintegrating the agricultural farmland was, in comparison, rather easy, except for the areas that were former battlefields, where millions of unexploded shells were still buried in the poisoned soil. But repairing, rebuilding, or converting factories would be a costly and time-consuming affair. And most of the military factories that had been built or remodeled to produce grenades, rifles, uniforms, helmets, and other wartime goods now had to be converted to make civilian goods. In early 1919, France could use the demobilization effect to offer veterans work in rebuilding the damaged areas, which was also a way to deal with the surge in unemployment. But this was only a short-term solution, and in May the French Parliament had to resort to steep tax increases. Now, the war had already forced the French government to take out high-interest loans to cope with the extreme costs. Money was no object in the fight for national survival, but now the interest rate would come back to haunt them. The longer the war had gone on, the higher the debt had climbed. And the overall sum by war's end was a staggering $5 billion. That's more than $73 billion in today's money, which the French now owed to Great Britain and the US. This crushing debt was of course hotly debated at the peace conference, with the French doing their best to seek relief. Either Great Britain and the US would have to forgive some of the debt, which was not a popular idea for their governments, or Germany had to pay, and the sooner the better. Le Bosch paiera, Minister Klotz said when confronted with the bill at the peace conference, but the Germans were not paying yet, and many politicians felt that France could not fund the reconstruction alone. Etienne Clementel, the French Minister of Commerce, pleaded for US help based on Wilsonian principles. The complete reconstruction of the north of France and Belgium is in essence everyone's business, the primordial task of the Economic League of Free Peoples. Now, Belgium had also suffered terribly from the ravages of war. With the front line running straight through the country, many villages, factories and farms close to the front were flooded, destroyed by shell fire or simply abandoned. Now, most of the country had been occupied by the Germans and they fully exploited its economic infrastructure. The Germans, of course, prioritized the factories that helped their war effort and neglected or simply dismantled the plants that were not useful to them. After their retreat, they took much of the machinery with them, or stripped it of valuable copper and iron. Unoccupied Belgium, on the other hand, had to keep up its armed forces and to provide for civilians and refugees crowded into the western part of the country. Trade came to a virtual stop during the war. The British blockade affected shipping bound for all ports, and the fear of U-boats left much of the Belgian merchant fleet stranded as well. Now, after the Germans were finally driven out of the country, the Belgians stood before a shattered economy. The only sector that had really thrived during the war was agriculture, as the Germans were keen to keep up the food supply. But in comparison to France, Belgium did not suffer such an oppressive weight of debts to foreign powers. That meant it still had the credit to take out loans and invest in a quick recovery for their industry. The Belgian Société Nationale de Crédit à l'Industrie, or National Industry Credit Cooperative, was able to effectively funnel privately borrowed money to the devastated areas, and it became a patriotic endeavor to make good the damages of the war. But private loans alone could not hope to cover the amount it would take to restart the country's economy. Like France, Belgium had to resort to higher taxes and stricter control of the market through government and foreign banks. On the one hand, this helped Belgium to recover the lost areas rather quickly and reintegrate the damaged industries back into their economy. On the other hand, the Belgian government became shackled to the interest rates of the banks, which in turn forced higher taxes and inflation. Like the other allies, it had to rely on Germany to pay for all of it in the end. And by the end of 1918, French Minister for Liberated Regions Albert Lebrun estimated that it would take 20 years and 100,000 workers to put the damage right. In the end, things went more quickly than this, and the work was mostly completed by 1930, though officially it continued until 1962. Even today, in northern France and Belgium's iron harvest, old shells and other war relics are still plowed up every year. Now, Our last question today is from Nikos Stavropoulos, who asks, I was curious to see the economic situation in Europe as well as in the United States in early 1919. Thanks for the question, Nick. Now, as I outlined with France and Belgium before, a lot of countries had made promises to compensate their citizens for their losses and sacrifices during the war until the reparations from Germany could be paid. 
But more threatening was the fact that the international commercial hierarchy had changed. Europe, it seemed, would have to make way for the new financial powerhouse that was the USA. Great Britain's war damages were less obvious in many ways. Instead of a war-torn countryside, Britain had suffered high losses to their merchant fleet and had to put aside immense sums of money to pay for all the pensions of veterans and war widows. But the real threat to the empire was the disruption of the global market. Now, Britain had been the main benefactor of the pre-war economic cooperation between the nations, despite and because of their rivalries. London, with Paris at second place, had been the financial powerhouse of the world due to the principles of free trade and a healthy import-export routine in a liberal capitalist system. But now, with half of Europe's economy in shambles and the other half in massive debt from overseas, Britain's future as the trading center of the world was in serious question. Now, the massive debts and overall financial and social insecurity were having an impact on the entire world empire. From early 1919 until mid-1920, there was a strong surge of inflation that gripped the world. Goods were in high demand, and prices were not only rising to unprecedented levels, they were actively destroying the market. To make matters worse, they were fueling the threat of revolution. Now, the costs of living were getting staggeringly high, while wages stayed mostly the same. Workers were flooding to the unions, and strikes were now more common than ever. In fact, there were more strikes in Great Britain and France than in revolutionary Germany. Socialist agitators were rising up, questioning if the war had really been fought to a victorious conclusion, and if maybe there wasn't still a revolution to be fought. Were they really the victors if their standards of living were getting worse? Now, on a global scale, a lot of countries were largely unaffected by the war, or could even profit from Europe's weakness, such as the Asian countries like China or Japan, but also South America, which were now buying up the market. Now, that drove up the import prices all over the globe, hitting Europe the hardest, as it was in dire need of those resources to rebuild the damage done by the war. Now, the Italian lire and the French franc were in free fall, and even the steadfast British pound was in trouble. Every country's currency, except the US dollar, had been disconnected from the gold standard, and their relative values were dropping fast. And all this in a time when they were expected to pay back their debts. All of them were counting on Germany's reparations. In this poisonous atmosphere, economist John Maynard Keynes, who took part in the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 as an economic expert, dropped his famous work, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, a very liberal, free market-centered book in which he strongly argued that high reparations would ultimately shackle Europe's economy, and that only the unfettered distribution of goods would benefit the world in the long run. Reparations would only serve the politicians who sought to reverse the peace. They would make nations distrust each other and turn their backs to the liberal global market and seek their lot in protectionism. The economic consequences of the peace became a bestseller overnight, especially in the US. The US economy was also hit by a post-war shock. A wave of unemployment hit the country as the war economy suddenly ground to a halt and the army was demobilizing at the same time. Now, in principle, the US shared the same interests as Great Britain in returning to a pre-war liberal market and restoring the international trading relations, now that the war regulations were a thing of the past. But due to claims on reparations and municipal debts, politics and trade were now in an interlocked state like never before. President Wilson was keenly aware that the US had to push for a leading role in restoring Europe as a trading partner. Like Great Britain, the US did not want Germany's economy to be fully destroyed, or shackled for generations to a maximalist sum of reparations. It needed a balanced Europe that would be a valuable trading partner, but not a dangerous competitor. But which path should Europe choose? Reparations had to be paid, but this would take years, even decades, and they could not even agree on a concrete sum. The only solution to the inflation problem was a massive government deflation of the market. Especially France and Britain had to forcefully rebalance the European economy and restore domestic order by adjusting the value of their currencies. But that would ultimately affect the US. Deflation could solve that problem, but if the Federal Reserve of the United States reacted the same way, by deflating its own market, it could drag down the whole fragile European economy. That was most certainly not the future the winners of the Great War were expecting. Well, that's all for this episode of Beyond the Great War. We want to thank Marcus Linke for helping us with the research for this episode. 
Keep your questions coming in the comments for the next episode, and remember that if you really want your question to reach us, you can consider supporting us on Patreon, or you can click the Join button below. And of course, we'll also answer community questions on our monthly supporter podcast. As always, you can find the sources we used in this episode in the video description, and if you want to check out our merchandise, there's a gallery below this video. I'm Jesse Alexander, and this is The Great War, a production of real-time history and the only YouTube history channel that is its own gold standard.